That'd be good. Yeah. Maybe after all this is over, we get to sit down and talk. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah definitely. Especially some other ideas about this. Okay. Some other. And I was with Mike last week at the NCFL. You know how you bring those? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we uh, ended up focusing thought that would be a good connection and we could you know maybe even do an offset again for Medicaid fund. Yeah, that'd be know, great. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Kay Garomani. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Medicaid and CHIP uh, and the Medicaid Director at the Health and Human Services Commission. I hope you all enjoyed this morning. Uh, and were inspired uh, by your colleagues, and also maybe learned some, some new things that you did not know were going on in the state. We have such a diversity here, uh, and it's uh, de definitely encouraging for uh, me to see all the great work that's going on. I, I wanna take a moment uh, before I introduce our, our first speaker to thank uh, Lisa Kirsch and our, do our DOS Khalsa uh, they both uh, work for me and head up uh, the DISRIP uh, 1115 waiver team. Your success is due in part to the very hard work uh, of these, these wonderful, intelligent, smart, uh, and, uh, and, and very enthusiastic uh, women. Uh, they do have a team now of, I guess there's 19 people total that are um, supporting the technical assistance that we provide to projects across the state, uh, working with the anchors, and also uh, working and managing our relationship with CMS. So I want to give you all a big round of thank you. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and then Dr. Lakey is going to introduce Dr. Johnson, who will be the second lunch speaker. I had the great uh, opportunity to uh, work with Dr. Lakey for several years. He served as the commissioner at the Texas Department of State Health Services uh, from 2007 to 2015. Uh, that's an eight year period of time, which is uh, probably one of the very longest uh, running tenures of anybody in state government, uh, particularly for a very large and complex agency as the Department of State Health Services. I got to observe firsthand um, the many things uh, that have made and aspects of Dr. Lakey that have made him a national leader, a, a Texas leader in public health and in healthcare improvement. Um, he is an individual who can uh, inspire uh, stakeholders uh, to work together uh, for common interests. Um, he had a great command of the many, uh, many, many programs uh, that uh, were under him at the Department of State Health Services, and he also uh, has a lot of integrity, and uh, I think that he is widely respected in this state, and also for his work nationally. Dr. Lakey served as the president of the Association of State and Territorial uh, Public Officials, and in that role, he worked very closely with the federal um, CDC and became a, um, a real uh, change agent uh, for a number of issues, in particular, um, his interest in improving better birth outcomes um, really allowed for a national campaign to emerge. Uh, Dr. Lakey is a man who understands data, he likes data, he saw what the infant mortality um, numbers were, were doing in Texas and was alarmed. Um, he developed a partnership with the Medicaid program, uh, and we worked very closely with Dr. Lakey. He on the, um, the, the public health and, and uh, kind of all-payer um, uh, perspective and Medicaid with the Medicaid perspective. And we have uh, done a number of things in that partnership uh, to improve birth outcomes. Um, Dr. Lakey is probably most recently um, known for his success with the Ebola outbreak in Dallas last year. He was able to take command uh, and provide leadership um, that I think instilled um, 
the American public's confidence that the outbreak was being handled well, even though I think there were other agencies who probably uh, had not had, they appreciated Dr. Lakey and, and his uh, team's assistance with that. He also was around uh, and led uh, a number of other um, epidemic uh, situations with H1N1 and then several of the uh, hurricanes. Dolly, Hurricane Gustav. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lakey. I'm sure this will be a very uh, interesting, informative, uh, and entertaining presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to put my watch right there to make sure I stay on time. Um, but as I look across this crowd, there's a lot of old friends, folks that I've had the opportunity to work with for, for many, many years. And so, so thank you, uh, and thank you for the support over those eight years as the Commissioner of the Department of State Health Services. Uh, as I begin my talk, uh, first, uh, one little disclaimer. I'm going to express David Lakey's thoughts today. Uh, these are not the UT Systems thoughts. And I no longer work for the state of Texas, and so they are not necessarily the state of Texas's thoughts related to the 1115 waiver and, and the extension. Uh, and I would also, as a disclaimer, know that um, many of you have been knee deep in the 1115 waiver much longer than I have been. Uh, it, it wasn't a Department of State Health Services project, although we were intimately involved in it. Uh, and so I know you know a lot of these things that I'm going to say, and uh, hopefully, uh, again, having been associated with it, an observer of it, that there are some things that, that I've seen that I think might be helpful to us as we think through where does Texas go next related to 1115 waiver in healthcare in the state of Texas. So, so with that, let me start off, and, and again, I'm going to be high, I'm going to be kind of like a 30,000 foot level, and it's, my title says I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor or Senior Vice President for Population Health, and I tell you, whenever I say that, a lot of folks have no idea what that means, and so let me tell you kind of what population health is when I think of population health, because there's a lot of people in population health are doing population health management or science, but what I'm interested in is health outcomes. You know, how are we doing related to improving health in the area that we have responsibility? When you look at that, you have to understand that you have to look at different groups of people, that there's disparities. And if we want to improve health, we really have to have a focus on disparities. And so it's a concern of the overall health of a population and the distribution and determinants of health and health disparities across the population. And the way that I describe it is I used to work in public health. I also worked in medical care. A lot of times those two areas don't talk together, and I see population health as trying to bring those two areas together as we try to, again, improve data related to health outcomes. And more than just data, it's people's lives, right? Trying to make sure that lives are better, healthier, uh, people are healthier in this state. And as we think through this, I think, and as we talk about the 1115 waiver, I think it's important to have a focus on the triple aim. And so a lot of times we in healthcare get very involved in the delivery of healthcare to an individual person, I think it's very important that we think broader, that we think not only how are we doing to improve the care of that individual, but what are we doing related to the health overall of the communities in which we are serving. And also, healthcare dollars are limited, and so what are we doing related to curbing the cost of healthcare? So let me just kind of talk about the, the, the challenge that I see that we have. You know, if you look at this, this is national data. We spend a ton of money in healthcare in the United States, about 18% of the GDP of the United States. That comes out to roughly $3 trillion annual cost, about $9,000 per each one of us per year related to healthcare. Now, if we're getting the best health outcomes in the world, you know, some people may say that that's worth it, but we're not. If you look at our birth outcomes data, if you look at our life expectancy data, we're really not doing that well when you compare ourselves to other modern countries. So we're going to talk about Texas. And so how does Texas do related to health? So let me just take a, a kind of a survey here. Who thinks that we're in the top third of states overall related to health, if you look at Who would say that we're in the bottom third of states? OK. Who would say we're in the middle? So let me show you some data. And again, I think it's very important to look at data to, to get a real gauge of where we're doing. And the American Health Foundation, the American Health Rankings, would say that we're in that middle third. That if you look back 10 years ago, we would be ranked 41st, 42nd, 45th in the nation. 
But if you look at data, we are right now ranked about 31st in the nation related to American health uh, rankings. So, so how do they come up with this ranking? How do they, they do this? And again, I think it's very important as we figure out why, where do we need to concentrate and focus as we improve health. Well, there's some things in Texas that we're doing very well. Uh, if you look at uh, disparities, we're actually doing better than the rest of the nation. If you look at how people rate their health, we do better than other parts of the nation. Uh, if you look at cancer deaths, we're doing better. Uh, but if you look at diabetes and obesity, and we had discussion about obesity earlier today. You know, the, you know, the facts are that about a third of us are normal weight, about a third of us are uh, overweight, and about a third of us are obese in the state of Texas. Uh, and that's going to have a huge consequence related to diabetes and the health complications of, of diabetes. But the thing that really pulls us down related to our rankings across the United States is that big circle that says lack of health insurance. And, and so that is where we have the major challenge. And again, we, I think all of us know that we, had, we're, we're, we were ranked around, we had about 25, 27 percent of the population in Texas that were uninsured. We're now about 20.8. Uh, and so we still lead the nation related to the individuals that do not have health insurance. So if we're going to concentrate on how do we improve health, you have to understand why do people get sick and die in this state. And the data are, are, are very different than they would be 100 years ago where this would be driven by infectious diseases. Today it is driven by chronic diseases. So heart disease, uh, cancer by far are the leading two causes of death in the United States. But we've also gotten smarter at how do we address these issues. And this, these causes of death are driven by what I would tell the legislature, three main drivers. Tobacco. You know, tobacco kills 25,000 Texans each and every year. Uh, we have some counties across Texas that have rates of about 40% of the adult population that smokes. Uh, tobacco is the number one causer of death in Texas. Uh, followed closely behind is obesity, and then followed not too far behind of that is substance abuse. So if you look at all the different components of substance abuse, it's the number three driver of death in the state of Texas. But I also think it's important, and I'm going to go through this slide very quickly, is that when we look at those numbers, those are the big aggregate numbers of the population as a whole. But if you start dividing out by age group, a couple of things became very apparent to me. One, kids die because of accidents in Texas, okay? Second, you look at throughout there, uh, intentional self-harm, number one, number two cause um, for the, basically from ages 15 to 44. Mental health is a huge driver of the challenges that we have related to health in the state of Texas, and we have to continue to try to get better at addressing mental illness in our state. Um, you also see with adults, it's a lot, you know, we don't talk about HIV as much anymore, but it's still in the top five for, for young men as a cause of, of death. If you look at women, it's the same type of, of, of data. You know, the, the 65, 75 years old individuals die from heart disease and, and cancer. Younger individuals die from accidents and mental illness is, is throughout the, the, these uh, indicators. So if we're going to address health in Texas, we have to understand disparities. And there are significant disparities in the state of Texas. And I have three that I'm going to discuss very briefly before we talk about the 1115 waiver and how we can move that, use that to, to move us forward. But there are significant racial ethnic disparities. There are significant geographical disparities. And there are significant disparities based on your educational attainment and how much money you make in, in the state of Texas. So let me just, again, very briefly talk about the ethnic disparities. Uh, the biggest predict, or one of the biggest predictors on how long you're going to live in the state of Texas is your ethnicity. And so individuals that are white tend to live longer in the state of Texas than individuals that are African American. Now, if you look over the last 20 years, that gap has narrowed, but there still is a significant ethnic disparity there. Where I see a significant disparity is when we look at infant mortality. So the chances of an African-American baby dying in the state of Texas is twice as high as it is for a Caucasian baby in the state of Texas, okay? So there's a lot of issues related to why that occurs, but you have to understand that there is that disparity, and we need to figure out how can we use our resources, the health system resources, to address this significant disparity in Texas. This also has become very apparent to me that 
where you live in Texas is a big predictor of your overall health. And so this is a study from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation from University of Wisconsin uh, where they do the county health rankings. And, and many of you are probably familiar with this. But if they look at the predictors of poor health, it's very apparent to me that East Texas and the border are different than the rest of the state. But if you actually look at health outcomes, it is rural Texas, especially rural East Texas, that by far has the worst health outcomes in the state of Texas. So with that, you know, how big is that? I, I kind of like this slide. Um, that, that, you know, I stole it from a friend, Jack Colley, who used to work for state government. Just to put this in perspective for our friends from out of state, that when I talk about East Texas, I'm talking about an area the size of combining Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island together, okay? It is a large area, and you know, as we talk about health policy decisions, you know, we should, should understand that how we address something in Texarkana is different than how we address things in El Paso, or Brownsville is gonna be very different than Amarillo. And again, just for those of you that you know, put this size in perspective, you may or may not like this next slide that I stole. Um, but, but again, just to put things in perspective of the challenges we would face, that you wouldn't think that Rome would address things the same th way as Hamburg, Germany, right? But that is the distances that we have in the state of Texas. So from my vantage point, what are the areas that we need to concentrate on? I truly believe we need to continue to concentrate on improving women's health and birth outcomes in the state. Uh, and that needs to be a major focus of the 1115 waiver. We also need to address the burden of chronic diseases and the, the role that tobacco plays in producing the chronic diseases. Infectious diseases continue to be a, a challenge, um, especially with related to HIV. And, and there's a lot of systems of care issues there that we need to get better at. Cancer prevention, and I would also say screening and early detection are continue to need to be a priority. And again, the data would show, me, would, would show to me that mental health substance abuse is a huge driver of the challenges we have. We need to continue to have a major focus. And as we do that, figuring out how the health system can be improved, looking at telemedicine, community health workers, retail uh, systems, you know, how, do we, how do we adjust the delivery of services to improve health in Texas? And then throughout this, understanding that there's disparities and we have to better address disparities in Texas. So how do we do that? I've stolen this slide from a friend of mine, uh, Tom Frieden, who's the director of the CDC, and he has this health pyramid. And there's certain things that we do in health that take a lot of effort, but do not have as big of an impact on an individual. And there's some things that we do that really do not take an individual's effort, but have a huge impact on population uh, health. And so the further we can get down on this pyramid by the things, activities we do, the better off we're gonna be at improving health. And so educating an individual one-on-one -on -one takes a lot of effort has minimal impact on community health, but as we get clinical interventions, long-lasting protections, and then changing that context in which decisions are made, so the healthy choice is the easy choice, that's where you really have the impact on population health, and then the social economic factors. So let's talk about the 1115 waiver, and again, this is David Lakey's thoughts, and it doesn't represent any organization I currently represent or have represented. Uh, but as I look through it, a couple words stick out to me that the purpose of the demonstrations is to demonstrate and evaluate, okay, policy. Uh, and it talks about expanding eligibility, providing services, but also to use innovative service delivery systems that improve care, increase efficiency, and reduce costs. The triple aim. That, that we really need to use this 1115 waiver to figure out what is working in Texas and figure out how do we take that to scale. In order to do that, we need to get much better at evaluation and, and looking at true measures of evaluation. Another kind of some verbiage that I stole from the Medicaid uh, site, their, their website, about their evaluation cr criteria. As I look down, that we, we, you, know, you talk about increasing strength and in overall coverage, increasing access, but again, improving health outcomes for Medicaid and other low-income populations and second, increasing the efficiency and quality of care for Medicaid and other low-income populations through innovations of transformational services and delivery networks. Again, the overall goal from the 30,000-foot level to me needs to be improving health outcomes in the state and figuring out how we can be more efficient in the delivery systems in the state of Texas. And a last a slide from our 1115 waiver is we talk about there's the uncompensated care component, which is a very important for uncompensated care. But the DISREP projects, the pull of incentive, uh, incentivize hospitals and other providers to transform their services. 
uh, delivery practices to improve quality, health status, improve experience, coordination, and cost effectiveness. Again, this is to help us not just fill in gaps, but to transform the system, bring in new systems, and figure out how we can be quicker, faster, smarter in the delivery of health care in Texas. So from my vantage point, a couple of challenges that I see. First, I think it's hard to tell the Texas story right now. Uh, and I think part of that is because we have 1,400 projects across the state of Texas, and, not, and they aren't always coordinated together. And so a lot of great projects, um, but with 1,400 projects, it's hard to tell that comprehensive story from my vantage point. And then each of those has many different measures, and we'll talk about uh, measures and metrics. Um, but with that many projects, that time, type of metrics, it's hard to tell the stories, and especially if we have a lot of output measures of people doing things, great activities, and haven't fully concentrated or can demonstrate the full outcome measures that I would like to be able to, be able to tell people that we have, we've done. Um, I think we need to improve our evaluation and have evaluation-based decision-making. That there are, there are a lot of great projects going on. There's some that weren't so great. And we need to be able to figure out how do we stop doing things that weren't as great for a variety of reasons. Even when people are well-intentioned and work hard, it may just not have worked out. So how can we concentrate, though, on things that really worked out well and then take those to scale? You know, how do we make sure that if there's a great strategy in East Texas that we can expand that strategy throughout the state of Texas? And the other challenge that I see is the difference between transformation and access. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So I think it's important for us to look at measuring what really counts. That we do a lot of output measures, measuring activities, kind of what we do. I think we need to get better at outcomes measures, the why, the results, the impact that we have on the communities in which we serve. And then get into real population health outcome measures. And I, I'd like to say that, that we're not the only people that are struggling with this. I, I have two copies of books here if you want to delve into this area. Uh, the Institute of Medicine, it seems like every three years, has a new document about how do we improve outcome measures. And so it's not just us that are struggling how do we do that. It's a nationwide struggle. How do we re really measure the impact of the work that we do? Now, I kind of made this up last week, th this diagram. And so I'll, I'll put it out there, and you can tell me if it makes sense or not. But I think you know, as we look at our waiver metrics, we need to, again, move from output, process measures, to outcome measures, including clinical, then population, and the socioeconomic. And that we have been concentrating on a lot of the output measures that we need to look at a future where we're looking at those outcome measures from a clinical standpoint and more into a population health. And the end goal is some of those socioeconomic things that we heard earlier today of you know, homelessness, et cetera, that are huge drivers of, of health. So let me just give a couple of, of examples of what I'm thinking. You know, if you look at birth outcomes, a lot of times we measure how many people we trained, an output measure. Uh, I think a better measure is what percentage of our young women are getting early prenatal care, what percentage of the women that have had a premature baby before get 17-hydroxyprogesterone in the time frame in which it's going to be effective. I think another better measure is what are we doing related to the percent of low birth weight babies in the state of Texas? How many babies are being born premature and how many babies are being uh, ending up in our NICUs in the state of Texas? That, that is a measure that I could sell to the legislature to say we made a difference here. And then overall, what did we do with cost and were we able to curb the number of kids that were dying prematurely in the state of Texas? For asthma, we can measure the number of educational programs that we put on. Um, the parent trainings, the number of kids that have been seen. Um, a better measure may be how well kids are being compliant, what percentage of kids are compliant to their medications. Um, a better measure is are, have we been able to decrease the number of kids that have ended up in our ERs and our hospitals, and have we been able to increase the percentage of kids with asthma that are able to stay in school because their asthma is better controlled. So a couple of examples here of a project, uh, Kate Starnes from uh, East Texas allowed me to, to show these slides. But uh, in East Texas, uh, in Regional Healthcare Partnership One, we have a mobile outreach ban. Uh, it goes to schools and it sees kids with asthma. Uh, it's seen about 800 kids. Out of that 800 kids, there's been about 270 kids that have been seen twice. And if they look at data from the first time that they saw them and a data a year later, they can demonstrate that they've been able to decrease the number of ER visits. They've been, they can demonstrate that they have been able to decrease the number of kids that have ended up in the hospitals. 
And you can use that data then to give a cost and a return on investment. So if an ER visit costs $1,000, you have a significant return on investment there. If a hospitalization costs $12,000, you've significantly saved money there because of a very simple new transformative project of going out to schools in a rural area and giving them those services. They likewise can show that kids are attending schools and are less likely to be absent and they're less likely to get steroid bursts. And so I think that is part of that kind of advancement in health and output, excuse me, outcome measures that we need to continue to, to move forward in. Likewise, in, in diabetes, you know, we have, I really like the patient-centered medical homes. But what I, when I got excited was when they were able to show me, so we got a patient-centered medical home, and after we did that, we can demonstrate the hemoglobin A1Cs are now better controlled, significantly better controlled in this population. Uh, the foot exams are taking place. Uh, you know, it's going to be a while before we can show that we have decreased amputations, decreased individuals that get put on dialysis, decreased number of people that are, that are blind. But we need to start setting up the format so that we can capture that data in the, in the future and the overall costs. And likewise, for behavioral health metrics, you know, a lot of the metrics that I see are we've seen, this, we've seen X number of people. You know, or we have set up so many integrated sites. What I would be interested in is how are individuals measuring their overall assessment? Are they less depressed when they do their surveys? And have we been able, by putting up our different components of the system, have we decreased the number of people that end up in our state mental health hospitals, the ERs, or the jails because of those projects that we have set up? Now, that, that, that is harder to do, but I think there's ways that we can set up those type of out, true outcome measures. So I have this little slide. I like Deming. He's a guru of, of quality improvement. And you know, I think you know, if you think of this as a huge quality improvement project, you know, a key to any quality improvement project are, are two, two things. One, that you have, you have your plan do, you check. You have an evaluation, and you figure out what's working and what's not working. And then if something's working, you standardize it. And then you can continue to improve. And so I think we need a better evaluation and a, a system that when projects are really good, that we roll them into some type of Medicaid managed care, et cetera, to be able to standardize those type of projects across the state. And my last point that I would, I would make is that I think, again, there's a difference between this type of transformation and access. Access is a huge issue, obviously, in the state of Texas. I think we need to get very smart in Texas related to a potential new opportunity called a 1332 waiver that will be available come January of 2017. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, but this may be a way that we can figure out how we can block grant uh, services back, funds back to the state of Texas, working with our federal partners to be, be able to really address access in a, in, in through the 1332 instead of being so reliant upon the 1115 waiver right now related to, to access projects in the state of Texas. So with that, my recommendations, um, I think we have to understand the drivers of poor health in Texas and use this to improve them. I think we have to continue to have a focus on the triple aim, and you have to understand that there's disparities and use this to improve disparities in our state. That we need to concentrate the 1115 waiver on really transforming our Medicaid system into a modern Medicaid system. That we have to strengthen evaluation, figure out what's working and what's not working. And in order to do that, we're going to have to at some point do some of the hard things of decreasing the number of projects that we have across the state so you can have that type of evaluation. And finally, I think as a state, we need to think through access in a, way, in a different way besides just the 1115 waiver and think through if a 1332 or other methods could be available to address the access issue in the state of Texas. So those are my thoughts. And again, that's just David Lakey's. Um, but, but I, I want to, to now transition to my next speaker, uh, Dr. Clay Johnston. Uh, Dr. Johnston arrived in Texas, I guess, a little over a year ago um, to be the dean, the founding dean of Dell Medical School, uh, part of the UT system, UT Austin. Uh, he has a, an incredible background of experience that he brings to, to this new role, uh, including previously being an Associate Vice Chancellor for Research for the University of California, San Francisco, uh, directing clinical and translational science, the Science Institute there, which was about a $112 million project. Uh, he's a graduate of Amherst and Harvard Medical School. 
uh, he not only has an MD, he has a, a PhD in epidemiology, and so he has that data perspective as we address population health. I had 20 years of experience at UCSF uh, before becoming, uh, as he became the a professor of neurology and epidemiology. Uh, you know, he's one of those individuals that has been very talented at being able to publish his work, has over 300 publications, uh, especially in the area of prevention and treatment of stroke and tra uh, transient ischemic attacks. And again, is doing what I think is transformable work here in Austin as we are establishing a new medical school with, with a goal of, of improving the health of this population in, in Austin as its primary motivation of existence. And so, uh, Clay, again, it's, it's a privilege to have you here and thank you for, uh, for being here today. Thank you, David. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And we didn't really clap for his talk and I thought that was a great talk, so let's clap for David's talk, too. So, so my talk's a little different. You know, being, being a speaker at lunchtime, I, I, you know, data's important, but I realize that some uh, informality is, is useful, particularly in the, in the middle of the day. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about, um, take another step back and, and try to get us thinking about a better way of doing this whole thing that brings us together, you know, improving health. So this is a, one way to show Moore's Law, and this is just the cost of a fixed amount of computing activity, and you can see a dramatic decrease in costs for the same amount of computing going from 1975 to 2015. This is a, a logarithmic scale. And, that has produced a world that kind of looks like this. You know, that we're, technology is everywhere. Um, and it's the way we communicate, it's the media, it's in every single industry, right? And it has transformed those industries and made them in many ways cheaper. Banking is a good example of, of one that's been transformed. But if this is sort of the world on technology, then healthcare, which accounts for 17.9% of the GDP, it kind of looks like this built on technology of decades ago. Um, and so the, the question becomes, why? Why are we stuck? Why haven't we evolved in this way? So if you think about Moore's Law um, with technology and every other industry, and in fact, we're, we're really, health innovation's really like Moore's Law in reverse. Um, costs have gone up, and the amount of benefit we get from those costs has, is not that obvious, right? And as, as David showed us, we are by far the most expensive country for, for healthcare, and our health outcomes are right around Cuba. So we're paying, you know, tenfold more and getting less than Cuba. So, you know, clearly there's a big disconnect. We would never tolerate that in any other industry. So what's wrong with our industry? You know, why, why is it that we have to have the government pushing us forward so much to make change? Why isn't this happening naturally like it would in the restaurant industry or the banking industry or any others? I, those fundamental questions are ones that this group needs to be asking, and we need to think about what the transition should be from where we are today to a better world. So that's what I'm gonna try to take us through a little bit now. So, you know, the healthcare system's broken. So let's examine the delivery system and just a little bit in terms of what major factors are, relate to this. We are, the, the fee-for-service system is what we're built on. And CMS helped to make that a reality. In fact, um, through that fee-for-service, there's no real alternative in, at, at the time um, we've driven up costs of care too, right? And docs are really good and health hospitals are really good at figuring out how to, how to wring more money out of a fee-for-service system. And um, they're just being good business people in doing that. Then they become highly invested in the status quo because it's been working for them, right? It, fee-for-service really works. So we end up doing more rather than doing better. We're not paid based on outcomes, we're paid, paid on doing more stuff. So of course we're, we're gonna do more stuff on the healthcare side. And then we treat the sickest rather than promoting health because we get paid a whole lot better for a surgery than we do for a prevention visit. And we don't get paid at all for a, 
uh, community intervention, the ones that are most effective, to reduce smoking or to, to impact diabetes. And in fact, we rely on grants, which are a terrible source of ongoing funding because they go away, and philanthropy to fund that stuff. And philanthropy also is, is a, a, a extremely difficult thing to rely on. So why aren't we actually spending money better upstream to prevent what ends up being a huge wastage at the downstream. And we all know this, we all live this, but just to remind ourselves, this is the system that we're currently in. Then of course we resist technology, because te technology has the potential to make us more efficient. And efficiency is not what's demanded of us. Um, so if a technology leads to an avoidance of a hospital visit, then what doctor is going to be for that? Uh, what hospital is going to, to be interested in that? So until we've flipped the way in which we pay and the way in way which we think about um, uh, how we approach disease, we're, we're going to continue to sort of patchwork fix things. And then I would argue too, and I, I've sort of been making this point along the way, that there's been a tremendous focus on doctors and their tools, so drugs, devices, all of that. Now we're starting to see some emphasis on, on care setting, but the real opportunities, and David made this point as well, it's in the community and how we impact the community. And again, we underfund and we underemphasize what happens at that level. Part of the problem is we don't even know what happens at that level, right? So we can measure some things at the individual level when we see a, an individual that's in front of us and we require all this documentation, in fact, around an individual visit, but we don't share that data. We don't roll it up in a way where it can effectively be used to answer the question, well, really, if I'm gonna target high blood pressure, what neighborhood should I go to? <laughs> and, and not just in a snapshot way, I, you know, it's hard to even know um, what the major public health issues are on a community basis. Interestingly, we, have, you know, we do have some of this data, we just don't talk about it, it doesn't matter to us enough yet. But interestingly, we, we've been with the uh, Department of Public Health here in Travis County looking at our own data a little more deeply. Well, it ends up that heart disease is number one as a killer in the country, heart disease is number one in Texas, but it's not number one in Travis County. It's number two, it's, it dropped, it's been number two for about four or five years. It wasn't clear at first, but now it's clear. It is number two and well below cancer. Why? What did we do right or what did we do wrong? We can't even address that question. And what could matter more to, to a population than its health and not to be able to address whether we're doing something right or wrong, it's pretty sad that we're not, you know, really we don't have the dollars and our attention at the wheel of the key triggers that could produce the kinds of health changes that we all want for our communities. And then I would say, as you know, I'm a big researcher, so I'm talking about my own stuff, but we're all in this category. The research system itself is also really broken. We put a big wall between what is research and what is care, and we say, okay, well, this is research. You get an IRB approval for it. You gotta go to the government and write a grant for it. Well, that takes forever, and, and you know, most grants are not funded, particularly in the areas that we all care about, right? So whether it's AHRQ, which may not exist, uh, soon, or PCORI, which is actually lauded, but not a very large, it's not as large as the average NIH institute, you know, which is focused on a single disease. And that's the money we use to think about how we move the healthcare system forward. So of course, most of these grants fail. CDC has a little bit of money that it devotes to this area. And those cycles are way too long. And then what happens when the grant's over? This is the worst part. So we, we prove something, we write our paper, we got to pull that thing away from the community, right, because we no longer have funding for the intervention that we were testing. And then who's there to take it up and, and, uh, and continue it, even in our local communities, much less in other communities. So there are a ton of papers out there, a lot of things that we can do better, and we're not doing them. And so research does not solve our problem. It's not a knowledge problem. It's in a dissemination and acceptance of the discoveries that we're finding. No other industry takes all of its research and development and says, okay, we'll just throw that over to the government for funding and we'll do everything else. Every other industry sets aside some of its own dollars to fund research and development. And it targets it at its pain points. So what would that look like for us? Well, that would look like 
the healthcare system actually funding its own innovation cycles, taking responsibility, directing those things around interventions that it wants to see happen to improve the way it delivers its mission. But we don't do that. You know, pretty, I mean, again, every other industry, but not in health. So it's time we take a big step back and just think, you know, is this the health ecosystem that we want? Um, not unique to the US for some of these problems, um, but it, unique within all industries, we are um, ossified, slow to innovate, and not responsive to society's needs. I mean, it's really pretty amazing when you take a step back and think about it. So can we do better? I mean, I'll tell you my answer to this is yes. <laughs> I put it at the end, but yes, of course we can do better. We have to be able to do better. What would that look like? So for one thing, the funding streams need to be based on the value that we're producing. And David made this point as well. We got to stop paying for, for, for the widgets, you know, for the, the very same things that we're measuring in the district projects. It's not about the number of visits. It's about whether the, the health outcomes that we care about are being achieved for, for our, our people. We need to, to recognize that those things have value and that in actually focusing on them too, we reduce waste elsewhere in the system. So cost is gonna be really important. There's a lot of ways we can use just wringing out the 30% of healthcare dollars that's waste to drive towards improvements in health. So focusing on that value equation, the dollar part and the outcome part needs to be key. So how do we do that? Well, it, we go to payers. The payers have to, um, they're feeling it. They're responsible for health outcomes for a group of patients. They've got fixed dollars to do that. How do we then go to them and say, we're gonna produce a better product for you in this area, whatever area it is, and we can show you because we can measure adequately the outcomes of the interventions that we have. So who are those payers? So it means really new kinds of partnerships with self-insured businesses, insurers, when they're taking risk, when they're not taking risk, they often get paid more if you spend more, right? So they're, they're, in that instance, they're not invested, although the, the self-insured businesses who are paying them that way really are. Um, hospitals definitely have some interest in this, although you know, not just on the provider side, especially as they develop more ACOs. Local health districts, absolutely, and CMS. CMS, gigantic payer. It wants to see its dollars spent better. Um, and so it becomes a payer at the table, too, to think about better ways to use its dollar. So the next thing we need is better data. And David mentioned this as well. It, we need it for prioritization to say, okay, what are the key problems that we should be focusing on? But we also absolutely need it because it's going to become the new, it needs to become the new currency for how we drive change. Um, if we can measure those, the outcomes that we care about, and we can measure cost in a real way over time, or at least model, so that when we, when we get you know, better looking feet in a diabetic, we can model what that's worth to us a few years down the line. Or if we drop blood pressure on, in a population by five millimeters of mercury, we know what that's worth down the line too. We need that kind of measure to assess the impact of, of interventions that we have. And all you are feeling that, right? So you all have these projects that you've, that you've implemented, and yet now we're at a stage where, you know, yeah, do we actually have adequate data to say whether you've been successful around the key things that, that we all care about? We need to in, speed up these innovation cycles. So, you know, the reason tech does this so well is they've got these innovation cycles worked out. They don't do a project for five years and then decide that it's successful. They do a project in every week or, or month anyway, determine whether they're successful or not, and they make modifications in that thing, whatever it is, as they go. And they build it up if it's successful and they tear it down if they don't. That sort of rapid fire innovation based on evidence needs to be a part of what we're all doing, not five-year cycles on a, on a fixed grant. But really, too, it's about how we liberate entrepreneurs. So we've had a tendency, because we don't have people coming to the fore and addressing these problems, 
like we do in every other industry. So let me just give you an example. If I, Austin's got a lot of great restaurants. If there is a, um, a need for Ethiopian food that's good in Austin, you can bet we will have a restaurant that produces excellent Ethiopian food. And we don't have to dig, the mayor doesn't have to say, you know, have an RFP. Anybody out there want to create a, an Ethiopian <laughs> restaurant? The system moderates itself, right? And a bad Ethiopian restaurant might come up and then get, you know, this is bad, so it's not going to survive. A new one sees an opportunity comes up. Similarly, we need people who are enabled out in the community, mostly practitioners at the front line, but also all of us who are t have uh, taken a step back, to look at the landscape and have an opportunity to introduce ideas, to create teams around those ideas, and to profit based on our success. What does profit mean? Well, we're mostly representing nonprofit entities, not always, but that profit piece of it, being able to do do well and actually not do it because it's the right thing to do, but do it because it pays well, that works in a capitalistic system. We don't currently have that in healthcare, and we do have it on almost every other place, at least not in healthcare related to the outcomes that we want to achieve. So to make this work, we really need to liberate the entrepreneurs, create a platform in which entrepreneurs can come forward and suggest these solutions. That also has, brings culture change. When you have people coming forward that can be engaged in finding solutions, then they're looking to embrace other solutions as well. We don't currently have that. Most people feel like they can't do anything other than you know, complete their billing or roll up all those bills into, a, um, into something that they'd send off to a payer. So question, isn't this just the district program? And the district program, obviously, lots of projects, lots of great things happening, lots of lessons to be learned. But, it, but a few sort of follow-up questions. So are five-year cycles the right length, even three-year cycles? I mean, probably within a few months, you know whether a project is going to work or not, right? So you should either modify it or tear it down. So the cycles themselves we really should have much more rapid cycles, be assessing more projects, evaluating them quickly over shorter periods of time. Are projects all they could be? So have we created the best, most impactful project that we could? No, that's never the case, right? I mean, they're never. Um, but could we have used you know, design approaches to addressing these problems? Could we go back to patients to address them? Could we be learning more from each other to improve the projects? Absolutely, right? If we had ongoing data to see how we were doing, we could make those course corrections as we go and modify and change and improve those projects. We need to be thinking about that because we should have better and we should all be engaged in making these projects all they can be. The incentives really aren't such that we're engaged that way. If we're paid more and we can expand our program because we're more successful, then we start to have that engagement with the project to want it to be the best it can be. So what happens when the five years are over? OK, uh, heaven forbid. We, don't, we can continue all these projects after five years. Are they going to continue or not? Who's going to pay for it? What happens to the trust that we've built in our communities by creating these wonderful new programs that we're now taking away from them? Wouldn't it make sense to be thinking about the long-term payment of these things before we even start the project? What does it take, you know, what do you need as a payer to continue to pay for this thing after a pilot period? What are the outcomes that you need? That gives us a kind of discipline that we don't currently have in, the, in, in any of our programs and, and a discipline that comes with commitment. If you achieve this, that's worth something to me. I will keep paying for that thing. That's, you know, that's, we need that, right, at the, at the transition. And then if all the projects are truly successful, so I don't know what the success metrics are going to be, but my guess is they'll be over 90% will be gauged to be successful, then why don't we see dissemination? I mean, I, I think that's a critical question. If, all of you are doing great things. Why aren't all the other counties following suit in, in doing the same things or doing their modification of it? So again, there's a, there's a level of discipline that's required 
and communication across projects that we need and we also need locally to be ready to embrace the solutions that are most effective. We're not currently motivated that way. We've got to change that. All right, so I think we could actually do this with a, by modifying the way we think about um, DISRUP. And I'm not going to go into any details about it, but I think it, by having some, some core characteristics of the program, I think we could, we could take the fabulous things that you all have been doing and the directions that we all want to go and speed things up and get to a better, better place. So one is I do think we need to crowdsource ideas. I don't think the ideas necessarily that come from us that are sitting around the table, happen to be around the table, are necessarily the best ideas. I mean, young people have great ideas, old people have great ideas, you know, docs in the clinic, a whole variety of places where great ideas can come from. We need to figure out how we collect those ideas. And they're, they're good ways to do this. Doesn't mean those become the leaders of the projects. Sometimes they will, and that's best when they can be, but often they won't have the skill set or connections to do that. Oops. And then we have to use the payers We've got to make them commit to ongoing funding if, um, and then they can select the winners. Who, which of these ideas goes forward? So then they're at the table helping to select the things that should be supported, but also once they've done that, they're saying, I will support this if it's successful. We have to allow the proposers access to key expertise and entree into the system. So here I mean, right now, you know, we got all these um, entrepreneurs creating these digital health solutions that are going to fail, right? Because they have no idea what we really need in health, for one thing. And there's no way for them to plug in and get paid for what it is they're doing. Um, there's no sort of receptor site for that stuff. Um, no way to see whether it's successful you know, when it's rolled out. So we need to be ready to build that out. The data system needs to be ready for that, but also the experts need to be ready who understand the health side to say, okay, this is a good idea, but this is the team that needs to be put into place to execute on that idea, which would include more people like us. And then program funding, we've got to start thinking about, okay, we've got this, this, this wonderful resource around innovation. Hopefully it's a giant resource, right? For most companies, it would be somewhere you know, between five and 15 to 20% of its enterprise. Somehow we gotta carve that out for ourselves. We have to use that just like venture capital, but around these sorts of questions. So we have to, we have to, to recognize that there are rewards for everyone who's sitting around that table, and that ought to be considered a, a very precious resource for investment in new ideas, some of which will fail and some of which will succeed. In order to do this, the data infrastructure needs to be much, much better. So um, that means we need, and this is where we can get a lot of help from government, we need to be sharing these data, although I do actually think a private sector solution may end up being what takes over. Um, but we need to be sharing this data, it needs to be much higher quality. Uh, you know, there are immediate uses for improving outcomes with that data, but also it is fundamental to us then understanding this population, being able to intervene and make changes much more quickly. And that's where I was talking about the ROI. Then it's the discipline of the ROI. What's the return on investment that you need as a payer to say that this is successful? We got to do that up front. And then we have to have the discipline to tear down underperforming programs and build up successful ones. It has to be built into the system so that it's not like an outside force that's going to look at us and we kind of try to placate them but that it's in our hearts that we don't want to do this if it's not having the kind of impact that we want. And the system can be built in such a way where if we're managing those resources as a group and we're optimally motivated to, to manage those, we can redirect them as we go and say, oh, well, that was such a great idea, but you know, it's a shame it, it just didn't work. Let's, you know, thank you for your work. We're going to close it down. Oh, we got these five new ideas over here that now we can fund because we liberated those resources. That's the way we've got to be thinking on a local level. And again, I think we can do this. So I think there are ways that we can take our, you know, the lessons learned, great lessons from the current program and these fundamental problems that we have in healthcare that are really the reason we're all here 
and bring those together to test a better system, a better ecosystem that really is a platform that brings more people to the table to find solutions for the real health problems, not to find more widgets and ways to wring dollars out of the healthcare system, right? I know none of us is here to do that. We got to have a system that, in, that allows us to creatively address these problems and move health forward. So can we, we can accelerate health innovation. I really do believe we can. Um, and I think this is going to be a great adventure. And, I, and uh, you know, we're in an interesting position in, in the med school because we're not at all dependent on fee-for-service medicine. And we're trying to stay away from that, that evil um, in order to be in a position to help to push along a change in, in the way we innovate in healthcare. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. John Johnston and Dr. Lakey. Uh, you really uh, challenged us to look at how we can improve the healthcare system. Uh, how does DISRIP fit into that picture uh, by um, asking us why? Why are we doing things the way that we do them? and presenting a number of concrete um, opportunities for us um, to answer the question of how, you know, how can we improve the healthcare delivery system. We have time for a few questions. Um, if uh, anybody has any questions for Dr. Lakey or Dr. Johnston. So I love the idea of entrepreneurship. Um, one of the challenges I find in our system is a lack of price transparency yeah. for what it costs. I don't go buy a car off the car lot not knowing what it's going to cost me every month, but I do that every time I go to the doctor. So how do you think um, we can evolve in terms of price transparency in the current marketplace? Yeah, so um, yeah, we got to get to price transparency. Prices really matter now to consumers. Um, for, of healthcare, and they haven't so much in the past. So the consumers are going to come to the table and, and drive it as well. Um, we we kind of have price transparency in the in the public sector. I mean, we know what is paid out for the things that are delivered. Um, so for for so many of the things that we're talking about, we we actually have adequate transparency to do the kinds of things that I'm talking about here. But you're absolutely right. The we've tended to have the, um, I mean, it happens over and over again. We've tended to have the private sector and the way it works and the profits off of it drive, drive the enterprise. And then those profits then help us address the health disparities and other things that, that David's talking about. Um, so getting to price transparency across the board is gonna be critical to, to better fix the system. Yes, sir. You talk about entrepreneur leadership and, and looking at establishing that. When you're looking at a, a capitalist-driven or concept that's coming forward, but the current trend in our country is going away from that. Going away from capitalism. Yeah, it's going away from the whole concept of uh, outcomes driven by, like you said, either profit or gain. And you know, it's, that's evil now. You know? So how do you see that changing even in your medical school and the concept you're looking at in the future? Yeah, so, so I don't, could, did you all hear that question? Shall I repeat it? So the, so the idea is, so you're, you know, you're, you're proposing, in effect, a capitalistic system embracing capitalism to address health disparities and health problems that we feel in, in the community. And the answer is, yes, we are. Um, and, you know, that is what I'm proposing. But it doesn't, when you look at it, there's no other real alternative. The only, I mean, there is one real alternative, but it's not, it's a big P policy political alternative that we're not gonna, you know, it's not gonna happen. You know, which would be a single, single payer system. You know, we're not gonna have that. So, so otherwise, we are gonna use capitalism to try to address these problems. Capitalism really is just about aligning incentives. Mm -hmm. And I would just argue we don't have the incentives right in, in our capitalist system. 
Um, but capitalism works in the U.S. in every other industry, right? So um, whether it's housing or uh, technology or restaurants or whatever, it has worked for us. It works really well, and it works within the the fiber of the of our beings, regardless of where we sit on the political spectrum. In that, I mean, I think that's true. So, um, so the thing for me is, how do we get capitalism to better um, align with our interests from a societal perspective? So it's the all the you know, in economic terms, it's all the externalities and all of that 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 make it that make it fail. And by the way, capitalism works in a nonprofit world too. We make nonprofits fail by making them go to philanthropy. Nonprofits could succeed if they had sources of income that were aligned with their mission. So if they succeed on their mission to improve health, they're paid and can grow based on that. So it doesn't necessarily nefariously mean you've got you know, uh, um, uh, rich people getting richer. It just means you've aligned the dollars. In terms of leadership, well then, you know, that is a big part of the school. So um, how do we, we've got a really different system now and a broken system, how do we create the leaders that help to address these problems? Um, and we have to look at systems, we have to think about creativity, we also have to get people to understand all the health disparities and where they come from and how we start to address those things. We have to focus on population health and those are things that we're, we're doing with our curriculum. And I guess the only thing I'd add, Eddie, to, to that conversation is I do think, you know, even though we're in Texas, that there is a, a role for policy and regulations to ensure that you have an equal playing field. And, and so the, the prime example in my mind is what happened with early elective deliveries, right? And so you had a hospital here in Austin that took a very firm stance that they were going to eliminate early elective deliveries, and they did, but the OBGYN physicians went to another facility that was not gonna play by those rules. And so they improved population health. You know, less kids ended up in the NICU, um, but the incentives were not aligned. And so the, the hospital lost a lot of money and they lost some of their physicians. And so you had to then have a policy decision by Medicaid to say, we're gonna, this is the best interest for the health of Texans, babies born in, in Texas. And so we're gonna put in policies related to what we pay for and what we do not pay for. And so I think there is in the capitalistic society still a, especially in healthcare, a role for regulation and, and policy done appropriately. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, I have the microphone, so I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> Peggy Smith, Baylor College of Medicine. And uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Lakey, I applaud your leadership. I think medical transformation is very important. But we at the medical school want to leave the 30,000-foot approach and go to 38 feet. I think that's what our elevation is in Houston. And I'd like to ask you, how are you going to integrate the emerging field of social determinants of health? I think Dr. Raymer, an old friend, said transportation may be the key factor in medical care. Mm -hmm. How are you going to integrate those social determinants of health and improving medical outcomes? Yeah, so, no, I, I, think, it's, I think it's critical. I think by changing the way we, we pay for health, we have an opp opportunity to bring new dollars to social determinants. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's, that's part of the transformation that we're, we're trying to, so if we, you know, if we really care about smoking because it has downturn consequences we don't want to pay for anymore, we can move those dollars up. Now you said get to the 38 foot level, which I didn't do by answering your, the question that so, way. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so maybe a couple other comments, Peggy. Um, so when I walked in, there was a discussion related to homelessness, right? And, and you know, if you're living on the street, you're not going to take your medicines. You're going to end up in the, the, the jails or hospitals, et cetera. And so I think as, you, as we address mental health, understanding that jobs and homes are very important in that overall concept of how do you address that, 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 that issue. I guess the other thing, you know, as you look at social determinants of health, you know, the biggest predictors of health, you know, a couple of the biggest predictors of health in Texas are education and income, right? We currently have a situation in Texas where the Medicaid budget is squeezing out everything else that we would love to be able to invest in in the state of Texas. Uh, primary education, our universities, et cetera. And so I think that is also you know, incumbent upon us to figure out how we can curb this cost growth because it is crowding out those other items that are gonna have a huge impact on the, the real social determinants of health. 
All right, thank you all very much. Please uh, join me in uh, a round of applause for our excellent speakers. Thank you very much, that was excellent, excellent. All right, we have a 15 minute break and then we will come back. Uh, we do have an excellent uh, panel uh, at 1.30. We've brought in some leaders, national leaders, and uh, so please join us at 1.30 for, for that.